Welcome everybody to the Healing Place podcast. This is your host, Terry Welbrock, and just wanted to take a second to thank you for being here and a part of this healing space for liking, sharing, commenting on videos and uh Yes, just helping this show continue to grow. Had our best month ever in October. So excited about that. Almost doubled September's downloads, um, which is just incredible. And the show's been on the air for over four years, four years and three months. Started in July of 2017. And last month's downloads accounted for over 11% of total downloads over all of that time. So it just just absolutely blossomed and I have you to thank for it um, so many people saying hey I was talking about the healing place podcast and told this friend to listen in or hey I have somebody who's experiencing some severe grief and so um, yes can you tell me what show to they need to listen to so it's just been wonderful and I just wanted to say thank you um, Again, a reminder to go to academy.terrywellbrock.com. Tell folks I have online courses and coaching available. Thanks. Now for the show. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Healing Place podcast. I'm your host, Terry Wellbrock, and very excited to have Glenn Head with me here today, cartoonist and author. And uh, yeah, we're, I'm just so super excited to have him here to talk about the relationship between trauma, healing, and art. So welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. And we started chatting just a few minutes before yeah. hitting record. And I'm, again, I'm so thrilled to have you talk about uh, art and in the role in healing trauma. Yeah. Um, yeah, as I was, as I was saying, um, I, I didn't get into this. I didn't get into drawing comics or this particular book with the idea of healing in mind, but it, did kind of come with it, so I was I was happy to see that. Um, I don't think one is ever completely healed uh, from childhood trauma and the things that you go through, but I think what happens is we learn to live with the scars, and I think that is uh, that that's in a sense what Chartwell Manor is about is living with those scars, and that life can get better. And part of that getting better process for me was in fact drawing the book. You know, like um, I was just saying, I uh, I feel better for having done it, and I wasn't really expecting that. But the process itself was was not really as difficult as I might have feared it would be. You know, for, for having spent two years at this boarding school, uh, quote unquote, uh, with this quote unquote headmaster who was really a pedophile, um, it's it's strange to go back there and relive that, you know, for what was two years and then to spend five years actually drawing it, it kind of makes you wonder, do I really want to do this? Yeah. But the actual process of drawing it was, was really uh, very enjoyable. It, 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 even though the process of drawing comics is, is pretty demanding, I didn't find the working out of this on the page to be that difficult. I, I kind of felt like it drew itself, you know. There's a there's a cartoonist uh, by the name of Chick Young who who drew the comic Blondie years back. And I, I believe he was quoted as saying that a good idea will literally draw itself. And I think if you draw comics enough, you you find yourself in that situation where like you're just drawing this because you gotta meet a deadline or you need the money or something. And then there's other times when sitting down and doing it, the next thing you know, eight or nine hours have passed and you can work a few more and you'd still be okay with it. That's more the exception than the rule, but that was the rule in this case. I spent all my time for the past five years, uh, weekends, all the time I had was, was, work, was work time and it was all very satisfying. Yeah, I and I totally relate to what you're saying because I've been every Wednesday I meet via phone with a previous podcast guest and we're both finishing up our book manuscripts and I read her a chapter she was asking about one of my chapters and so I said hey I'll read it to you and I read it and afterwards I said you know I don't remember writing that it was as if it wrote yeah. itself sure and it, yeah yeah that that can happen it's good when it does because uh, uh, we all know the opposite. 
where we're struggling and it's, it's sure not writing itself. And the best that you can come up with is what you struggle to get down. And I think art is always a struggle. I think that's just the nature of it, but it also in its way is very satisfying. I just think it's that kind of process. You know, you're facing a blank canvas, a blank page, and to go from nothing to something, to turn it into something from what it wasn't, you know, which is just a blank, requires this kind of fulcrum of psychic energy. And that's difficult, that's work. But once you start getting there, you know, you get past the hard stuff and you get into the good, you know? Yeah, it just, it's, it's hard, so hard to explain. It's like a flow when, in once you, once you turn the valve on, it's, it's that getting started process. <laughs> and once oh, yeah. you get it going, then yeah. it just, it does, it flows. I mean, yeah, getting good work habits is, is everything. I mean, I, I recall hearing that from other cartoonists that like, say you don't have enough time to really devote you know your your life to what you really want to do you know and all you have is like part of a day well make sure that you do a drawing a day and that way you'll keep your hand in it you know what i mean to yeah. to find some way to stay involved with it because if you do that it won't be that hard to pick it up the next day everybody knows because everybody has taken time off and been like how do i start this up again some people, you know, you can easily go for years without without doing anything. It happens to the best of us, really, you know? Yeah, yeah, which is probably why it's taken me seven years to work on this book. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I, I think it's it really depends on the writer, the author, the artist. I, uh, some, yeah. some of us as cartoonists are amazingly prolific and others of us less so. And a lot of us are in between. Um, personally, when I'm working and it's going really well, I got the best work habits on earth, but when it's not going well, I can just really feel like a bum. And the point is also that in, in art making, you got to be your own boss. You got to find your own set, you know, your own way of, of self-discipline. And nobody can really give that to you except somebody like an editor who says, this is when it's due. Right. But if it's work you really want to do, that's really important to you maybe something you've got to decide to do on your own and then you really do need to be very very self-disciplined you got to learn how to face it day in and day out yeah well and it becomes we say it often on this show a habitual pattern and it's it's amazing right. when you create that habitual pattern then um it does just become yeah easier to do yeah, yeah. i know i know like all like all habits the good and the bad it's like whatever you've been doing. I, I remember hearing this one day that uh, I think it takes approximately 25 days to uh, instill a habit that, you know, and by that point, and I heard this actually in relation to getting sober, that that's how long it takes somebody who's given up drinking for this to be something that you just do, you know, that you didn't drink yesterday and you're not going to drink today. And yeah, I think all habits get like that. Just you know, yeah. whatever you're used to doing, you're gonna you're gonna continue with probably. Yeah, for sure. Well, I've read the the reviews on on your book, and it's just, I mean, just praises. It's beautiful what people are saying. So um, I'm very satisfied with that. That's been good. Yeah, it's it's just amazing. And um, so, do you mind sharing a little bit of your of your story? No, of course. I mean, you know, that's that's partly what I'm here for. Um, uh my story in the boarding school or my story whatever you feel oh. whatever you feel moved okay. to share um well you know um i guess i guess i'll talk about the time that the book takes place in first of all as well as the book i mean this uh this is a story about me being in this boarding school it was really a criminal enterprise uh the headmaster uh was a pedophile and ended up doing, he got sentenced to 14 years, but he only did seven. And a lot of what the book is really about is facing, facing that uh, on, on my part. Like the first page in the book shows drawing table with an inked portrait that I've done of this guy. And there's also a pack of cigarettes, a bottle of booze. There's all these things that are in there that are indicating what the struggle is to actually face this work, you know? And I guess in a sense that 
is the major, one of the major themes of the book is just coming to grips with your past, with what it's done to you and where it leaves you and what you have to do to heal or at any rate survive. Um, so yeah, it, it begins in 1971 and it shows the two years that I was at this place. And that's a significant chunk of the book, but it's not the essence of it. See, it's about 70, maybe 80 pages, if I remember correctly. And the rest of the book, you know, there's 236 pages all told. So a lot of what it really is about is healing from that kind of trauma and facing it. So you have the years that follow, uh, classic 70s teenage miscreant type behavior, you know, drinking, drugs, uh, pornography. And pornography is worth mentioning here because uh, a lot of what goes on in the book is, is really about habits and especially how sexual habits happen and then they follow us. And we sort of become who and what we are as a result of some of those habits and they don't go away and we have to deal with them. So that's how you see my character operating through the guise or the mask of those bad habits until he can eventually begin to take that mask away and then deal with life a little bit better. And that is like the key. I, I think that like uh, having been sober and having been around the block with a lot of different kinds of meetings and therapy and all that, my own experience is that we do get a little better. It's a little better. We get better incrementally and our behavior changes and our mindset changes but we're not exactly a different person. We're just a less destructive version, a less self-destructive one. And that, so that I'm, I'm sort of giving you how the, the book progresses and, and what it's about. What it's also about is my character and other characters who become, you know, who are grown up after having been at the school and what they went through and what I went through, how one of them, in fact, even uh, was involved in the court case, getting the headmaster into prison. And I wasn't. So I, I was kind of, in certain respects, a passive bystander in some of the story, not entirely. And I was also victimized at school, but I was sort of a little bit on the sidelines with some of this. And it's also just a classic way that you can tell a story autobiographically is to not have yourself be the central figure all the time, which I'm not, but at the same time, I'm always part of the story. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of showing how a life becomes affected by childhood and what it takes to grow through it and what it's like to experience it. And hopefully, the reader will share that experience and feel that experience because that's what I'm really looking for. Uh, I'm not just looking to tell a story. I'm not just looking to lay it out there and find some catharsis. I'm really attempting to make the experience palpable and human so that anybody that reads it will feel it because that's what I want. I want you to feel the story. I don't want you to just like be like, Oh yes, very nice. Thank you. You know what I mean? Right. I'm trying to right. do something that is that is uh, undeniable. You know, you can love it, you can hate it, but you won't just be like, yeah, whatever. You know, it's very important that that this not be taken that way because we all deserve better than that. I know I do, and I know that the uh, former students from this place deserve better than that too. Because basically, these places tend to get buried, like. Nobody practically knows this particular story. There are people in New Jersey who know about it and it was written up here and there in the papers, but to really unearth it and go into that in depth so that you know all the specifics, uh, you know, that's, that's different. That's really- Wow, and it just, what a gift it is because such courage to, to shine that light in that darkness and and to yeah to expose it and bring it forth um is just amazing yeah well, thank you I'm, I'm, I'm glad you think that 
Um, it means a lot to me to, to be able to do it. One thing that I uh, often allude to is that this is not my first memoir uh, or my first graphic novel. And I needed to do a previous one, which was harrowing, but not on this scale, I guess you could say maybe. And it was about me being a 19 year old runaway kid who ends up in Chicago. And I meet some of my underground comics heroes. And I even meet Muhammad Ali on the street. And it's a sort of a wild tale of somebody being on their own that way. And, and not unlike Chartwell Manor, there are scenes where I have to fend off, you know, sex predators. So it, it has a connection there. But the point is, um, once you've done a story like this, you realize people are not going to hate you for doing it. See, you, you have some weird irrational fear that if you put this stuff on the table, people are going to condemn you. And it's not that that kind of thing is entirely never going to happen, but it mainly doesn't. You just have that fear that it could because you can't bring up stories like what happened to me in this boarding school in polite conversation. If you're at a cocktail party, you're not gonna be talking about it. You're not gonna be talking about it to many people because it's uh, almost too big for most people to just kind of grasp or handle. They might, they might react either with derision or with some kind of humorous offhand comment simply because they just, they don't wanna be asked to handle it. And that's their right. And I think it's important to understand that not everyone is capable or willing to look into a story like Chartwell Manor. So it's my job to make that into an engaging story so that once you pick up the book and you start reading it, you're gonna to wanna to know what happens to me. You're gonna to wanna to know what happens in the story. So it, but that's my job. It has to be couched that way. It has to be told in an engaging narrative for me to expect anybody to A, wanna read it and B, be willing to pay the 30 bucks to buy the thing. So it's also by way of saying that like, I need to be high functioning as, you know, uh, an entertainer, because that's the thing you have to, you have to make this stuff work as entertainment, meaning, you know, an exciting story. Yeah. You have to and that. people want to come back and tell everybody else. The, to yeah, read. sure. Yeah. It's, it's part of it. It's part of, uh, the field I work in, you know, right. it's, it's inescapable, you know, you, yeah. you're not, you're not going to be, you better not be boring people is what I would, <laughs> I would tell anybody that in, in whatever form of co comics they might be attempting. Um, boredom is, is, you know, the death knell. You should never bore anybody. And the reason I mentioned that also is because in autobiography, there can be a tendency for people to sort of, you know, just vomit up what they're experiencing. And, I wouldn't do that because, you know, I think people want more than that, you know? So. Right. Now you started drawing young at 14, right? Yeah. Um, the, the book actually shows some of this where I'm, I'm at the school and if, if any good thing can be said to have come out of my being there, it was that being put in this different environment, I was able to, you know, unexpectedly cultivate, a creative identity for myself. I started drawing and people liked my drawings and that became my thing. And you know how it is when you're like 13 or 14 or 12 or whatever, and you're, you're trying on different hats to see which one is you. Am I going to be a decent enough athlete? Am I going to be this or that? And, and it turned out that at that particular time, I was the school artist. And so that became the thing. And so that, that was what happened in, in conjunction with all the other things that were going on at the school was that I was drawing a lot as a way to cope with being at this school as a way to just, you know, find a way to duck the headmaster and maybe some of the other kids, you know, just, just, you know, find a way to do that. You know? Now, were you, were, do you think you were revealing anything in these drawings or were they more benign? Drawing. They were pretty benign. They were, they were like the kind of thing any 12 or 13, 14 year old boy would do, which was like, you know, fast cars and goofy cartoon faces and stuff like that. It was, it wasn't anything too uh, personal. It was just, you know, 
it was just, you know, the excitement of, of learning that you could kind of draw, you know, that if you put your mind to it and you have some colored markers, you know, you could, you could copy a t-shirt design or something and other kids would be like, wow, you know? And so that's just an exciting thing to, to have happen. And it, it makes you feel, you know, you can do something, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's not much more than that, but it's a good thing in a place like that because uh, you got to have something that you're doing. <laughs> you want to, fall prey to the wrong kind of things that are right there waiting to grab you. So right. art's not a bad thing to have in a place like that. It wasn't. Yeah, for sure. Now, did you, when did you first start to tell your truth? Regarding the school? Yeah. Um, it really took quite a while. Uh, like I was mentioning earlier, um, I had been like, well, I didn't say this actually, but that um, it took a long time to be able to handle the material. And it took a long, that's why I mentioned doing a graphic novel. You see, um, when you work on a big canvas, you can get a lot of time into it. See, uh, a graphic novel, first and foremost, I, I believe, is different from a, a comic book in that you just can get a, an element of vastness to it. You can get a lot of time. You can get a lot of character. You can really develop a character in a way that you can't in either a comic strip or a comic book. And what I didn't understand when I attempted to draw this story several times, decades past, was that that was what was required, that it was really going to need that kind of vastness to go into my childhood, my teenage years, my adulthood, my later adulthood. I, I didn't get that. So I attempted to work on this material sometimes and I would allude to it in various comics, but I think I really knew that it was going to take something much bigger, you know, to really be able to express it. So um, I, I, I knew that it was very important material and, and from a comic book artist's standpoint, I really believed that I had to do this and that it had real possibilities because um, one way to look at this is that the ped pedophile himself is kind of a uh, cartoon character of, of an evil variety, you know, just sort of... Um, such an extreme character, you know, kind of like on the one hand, charming and charismatic and uh, verbose and pompous and loud and uh, cunning and conning and just a grifter on all these different levels. And you see, that's a great thing to draw. When you're drawing comics, it really can help to have really big characters or characters that you can really delineate and this character, Terrence Michael Lynch, the pedophile, was perfect that way. He was, he was almost an absurd underground comics parody of a headmaster, you know. See, when I was at the school, I also first saw underground comics. And like anybody else who saw them, they blew me away. But, you know, because there was a lot in them about sex and violence and crazy behavior. And it was kind of an unusual experience to be seeing them, you know, in this context. And that's something that I also really wanted to work with so that you saw something of this headmaster who was sort of demonic, as well as some of the comics that I was looking at too, which were then also rather demonic. So you, you see a page where my character is opening up you know, the page of a like Zap comic, and there's just this wild, crazy, demonic sexual image drawn by S. Clay Wilson that I copied. And uh, yeah, I was trying to trying to depict uh, being stuck inside this world, not not ready for any of it, not ready for the school, not ready for this headmaster, not even ready for these crazy comics. So I was, I was trying to depict all that. This this. Uh, crazy world that I was stuck in, you know? Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's important to me to, to, to capture that, you know, I mean, uh, 
the thing that I, that I really like in comics, one of the things I really love about them, aside from that they can be funny and they can be dramatic and they can have great stories. The thing that I really love about comics is that um, you can invent your own world. That's a very exciting thing. And I believe that actually that's one of the things that really grabs a kid. You know, when a kid first sees a comic book, they may not even be reading it, but what they are seeing is some amazingly exciting splash panel where all this action is happening, all this stuff, and it's like cartoony and it's nuts. And you're like, and, and what you're also getting when you see that is this individualized world. That is if the artist is any good and they've developed their own world and they are putting it down there, that's exciting. And you want to do that. You know, you want to do something that has that, you know, that is its own world, that a reader can open up that book and walk around in that world. That's just, that's the best. It's also, it's great if you can draw that and make that happen, but it's also great if you can pick up a comic book uh, that, that has that, that, that you feel that world is real and it might be dangerous. It might be a lot of things, but you believe it and you believe that the artist who drew it knows that world you know he can populate it in his own way you know yeah very cool so how do how do people find the book how do they is it on amazon is it it, it is it's on amazon and, and uh you can also go to uh my publisher fanographics you can go to the fanographics website and you can purchase it there uh but that and amazon yeah and you can also see my work at uh Line ahead comics uh, on Instagram. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah. So anything else that you wanted to touch upon that we haven't had an opportunity to talk about? Um, no, not really. I mean, I, I just want to say that, like, uh, I don't know. I, I would encourage anybody who feels they've been victimized in any way to to seek a way out of it, whatever it might be, it could be therapy, but, but art is definitely legitimate and uh, it's, it's worth doing. It's, it's worth finding your way through things by drawing them. It certainly isn't going to do you any harm. So just that. Yeah. I think parents encouraging their children, yeah, to pursue whatever, whatever it is that uh, helps them work through their struggles and difficulties is. Yeah. Yeah, it's also funny. One thing I'll mention is that like uh, I've been around a while and seen comics through a lot of different times and uh, comics have gained a lot of respect. And I think parents, teachers actually would even be happy to see kids doing that. So it, it has lost the uh, rebellious troublemaker, wise guy thing that comics really had that I grew up with, with Mad Magazine and Underground Comics. And uh, it's just, it's interesting to me that, um, you know, kids, kids learn to read with comics and with graphic novels, which is amazing. You know, you really weren't supposed to be looking at that crap when I was a kid, you know what I mean? So that, that's something I find amusing and uh, different. You know? Yeah. Oh my gosh. You just said Mad Magazine. It so took me back in time. Like I had a flashback yeah. to. Yeah. 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 And it, it, yeah. it went under a few years ago, but it, you know, it was something that like, uh, that was a big deal. You know, the whole idea yeah. of the parody and, and uh, that, that, that was a big deal. And, and, and everybody really loved that. That it, it, it helped everyone cultivate that like wise guy mentality about all the different things they saw, you know, that, you know, you could make fun of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Oh my gosh. Well, thanks for that. Thanks for that memory. That was awesome. Sure. <laughs> All right. Well, it's just been amazing to have you here and thank you for thanks. touching on this subject. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks again. And thanks a lot for having me, Terry. Oh, absolutely. Uh, everyone, thanks for joining us on the Healing Place podcast. And remember until next time, be gentle with yourself. Thanks. Bye-bye. Hey, everybody. Terry Welbrock again. Just wanted to thank you for listening to the episode today and remind you to visit my website as well as the academy 
www.terrywellbrock.com for the courses. But if you go to my website, terrywellbrock.com, you can sign up for my monthly Hope for Healing newsletter, which is also jam-packed with information and strategies and blog pieces and guest blog pieces and links to shows um, and just a great space for, uh, again, healing and hope strategies. Thanks for, again, being here and being a part of this healing space. I very much appreciate you. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.